Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather, where each week we try to give you a capsule of one of the global issues that India is watching most closely. And this week it's been right here in the region. After nearly a decade sharing power with civilians, Myanmar's military staged a coup. Civilian leaders of the Southeast Asian country have been detained, including Nobel Peace Prize recipient Aung San Suu Kyi. Myanmar's military leaders are laying out conditions for a return to quasi-democratic rule after seizing power in a coup. India's neighbor Myanmar reverted to military rule after a decade of embarking on the road uh, to becoming a democracy. The army or Tatnador chief general Lang has explained some of his reasons uh, for what he did. Uh, including overturning the government, arresting the president, Win Min, also Nobel laureate, state councillor, and, and Burma's most famous leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, is uh, in prison uh, right now, as well as the top leadership of the ruling National League for Democracy, NLD party. Uh, the reason he gave was that he was contesting the results of the election held in November, in which the NLD actually won a landslide victory uh, and the uh, army's own proxy, the USDP as it's known, uh, actually did very badly. But the truth is that democracy never really took firm root in Burma or Myanmar as it's now known. Aung San Suu Kyi was released in 2011 and her party contested the elections and, and came to power in 2015, uh, has never really been able to push back the military and, and convince them to give up many of its powers. It still nominates as much as one fourth, 25% of the two houses of parliament or Luto as, as they are known. It retains the border, uh, interiors and defense ministries. These are critical portfolios and one of the reasons why India has had to engage quite so closely with the Myanmar's military leadership. Now that General Lang has announced a year's martial law, uh, shut down much of the internet, a crackdown on any protesters that are able to come out or group uh, on the streets, it really remains to be seen what if anything can do uh, can be done to bring democracy back on course. Uh, the international community, remember, that has been quite disappointed with Aung San Suu Kyi for the last few years, not only because of this failure to push back the military uh, for problems within her own party, where she's seen as a very authoritarian figure, but also her defense of the military's pogrom on the Rohingyas that forced uh, more than a million people to flee the country uh, and, and, and many of them in Bangladesh. The international community has, however, raised a, a voice in her favor, but it's still a very feeble voice. So what really should we be looking out for on this story in the next few days? I think there are three main components to it. What the US will do, what the United Nations will do, and what India will do. To start with the US. The coup in uh, Myanmar really came at a time where the Biden administration was still finding its feet. What it means is that it is going to be on the mat to prove itself with this first real challenge to what it has seen as its policy of bringing democracy back to the fore, bringing human rights and other values back to the fore. Mr. Biden has said in a speech that he gave at the State Department this week that what America is planning to do, America is back, he said, and they are going to stop the creeping reach of advancing authoritarianism. He referred to Russia and China, but also made specific references to Myanmar, uh, saying that those responsible for this coup are going to be held to account. The US NSA, Jake Sullivan, has already said sanctions are being discussed and how strong they're going to be and how many they're going to be uh, really is what we're looking to watch in the next few weeks. Um, the truth is that the US has followed this script in the past when Aung San Suu Kyi was in prison. It, it only ensured that Myanmar became even more dependent on its other neighbor, China. Uh, and that's not something that the US is hoping to do. Uh, so it is in a bit of a slight uh, catch-22, if you like, there. As far as the United Nations has gone, it has actually held a, a, a meeting in the first week, issued a press release. But the press release, again, has toned down language. It calls for a return to democracy. It calls for the government to revoke the steps it takes. It expresses support uh, for the democratic transition. Um, but it's, it's, it seems 
quite clear that behind closed doors, Russia and China were able to ensure that no stringent measures were proposed at the UNSC, which really means that uh, what we will watch for is whether the United Nations goes ahead and announces its sanctions and then whether it comes to the UN asking it to endorse them. Uh, the third part of this is, of course, India, which is not just a regional power, but also a member of the United Nations Security Council right now. So far, India has walked that balance. Uh, urging the Tatmadaw on one hand to release the prisoners, to follow the rule of law, uh, to follow the democratic process, but making sure it does not upset the military in any way. Uh, the External Affairs Ministry has uh, made it very clear that India will not be part of isolating Myanmar or part of boycotting uh, Myanmar. It continues to have a strong relationship with the military, both, of course, to keep a check on uh, insurgencies and insurgent groups in the Northeast, but also to keep a, ch a check on China's influence in the region. India has several projects in Myanmar, uh, the Kalagan Multimodal Corridor, the Trilateral Highway with Thailand, the Sithwe Port as well, all very, very critical infrastructure projects. Um, finally, at a time when the Modi government is itself under criticism for its handling of the farm protests, there's only so much that it is going to be able to say, that New Delhi is going to be able to say about the Myanmar crackdown on protesters or the internet ban um, or any of the uh, you know, security forces being involved over there. The truth is this, and particularly Myanmar, is a battle between pragmatism and idealism. And that's one where pragmatism often wins. There is also a global aspect to what is what the turn that Myanmar has taken. You know, this week, the Economist Intelligence Unit, the EIU's Democracy Index for 2020, said there's been a global setback in a year of coronavirus to democracy. In fact, it classifies 167 countries and of which it only said 23 were full democracies. 52 were flawed democracies, 35 hybrid regimes, and then 57 pure authoritarian regimes. India has now been classified as a flawed democracy, but it finds company with countries uh, like the US and Brazil as well. Myanmar now has rolled into the authoritarian category. If you're looking for more recommendations on what to read about what's happening in Myanmar, I suggest uh, a look at history in Myanmar as well. A scholar and historian, Tant Mint Yu's Where India Meets China, uh, as well as his next book, The Hidden History of Burma, are, are both worth reading. Uh, Bertel Lindner's Great Game East about uh, China's inroads in the region, particularly Myanmar. And then uh, uh, Negin Pao Kipkin here in India has written uh, the, uh, the, uh, about Myanmar or Burma's political history worth a read. Also worth a listen, the In Focus podcast at The Hindu, uh, my colleague foreign editor, Stanley Johnny speaking to Jain Sriram about the coup. That's it from me this week. Join us again for Worldview. Our website www.thehindu.com will have the link for you. Please do write in with your comments and your suggestions and also requests for any global issues that you want covered. From the team here, thanks for watching.